I wonder if maybe your family has any Christmas traditions that you observe every year. Maybe you go and cut down a fresh Christmas tree and drag it to the house. Maybe there's a movie you sit down to watch or a time where you have hot cocoa and read the Christmas story. Or maybe even it's all the kids get to open up one present on Christmas Eve. In our house, some of the traditions that we do each year is it seems like we always go to a drive through light show somewhere, at least one time. We get a brand new pair of pajamas on Christmas Eve so that everybody looks nice for the pictures on Christmas morning. And then on Christmas Day, for dinner, we eat fried shrimp and then have chocolate meringue pie for dessert. That is of the Lord. So if you need some new traditions, at least get that one, right? The fried shrimp and the pie. A tradition that we have started here at our church, I think for at least four years, this may be year number five, is we like to remind ourselves of what the Christmas story looks like through the eyes of children. So I greatly introduce and want you to know this is one of my favorite videos in all of the world. If you have not seen it, your life is about to get better. Even if you have seen it, it still makes your life better. This is the Southland Christian Church, Christmas According to Kids. An angel came to see Mary. She was doing laundry, and then the angel just appeared, and she was really scared. So Gabriel was like, Mary, you're going to have, what? I can't, I can't say good. Mary, you're going to have a baby. I, you're going to have a baby, and you will call him Jesus. And then Mary was like, I'm not going to have a baby yet. I'm only a teenager. I'm not married. Then the angel Gabriel told Joseph that Mary is not lying. She, you are having a new baby. And so they met up. They went to Bethlehem, which was Joseph old town. They ride a donkey. <laughs> I don't know. A camel. Oh yeah, a camel. She said, this donkey's fast. Well, they tried to go to a hotel and they asked the keeper um, for a place to stay. The keeper said, we have no rooms. Literally no rooms. <laughs> so Mary and Joseph walked away sadly, but then he said, the only place in he in Bethlehem hand that that you can stay stay is a staple and then he just pointed the way and they followed. When the shepherds were taking care of the sheep, and then they saw angels. The angel said, A new baby is get, getting born who is king of the Jews. The angel were singing. And then the shepherd said, I think we should go there and meet him. The second, I think, said, yeah, I agree with you. And the other said, yeah, me too. They had to walk through a bunch of grass and bushes, maybe have to camp out a night. And then the wise men heard about it. And then a star appeared. We should probably follow that star. It's pointing down to the barn. So maybe we should follow it. Maybe. So the wise men went to Jesus. They gave them gifts. A stuffed animal, like a hippo one, to have at home. Some diapers, and <laughs> some wipes, and some milk, <laughs> some shoes, some Jordans. Gold, Frank, and Latimer. And I don't know how I would survive in that barn. Too stinky, too crowded, and ugh. I think he probably pooped because the room was very smelly. Thank you for coming. He's adorable. He's gonna be our best friend. I love you and you're the best baby I ever seen. There, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> the new baby is gonna change the world. I love it. I love the cute kids, the funny adults, and it tells a lot of the story of the birth of Jesus fairly accurately. Every December, we do a series 
and we look at the birth of Jesus because we want to ask the question, what exactly happened and what events were there when Jesus was born, and what does it mean for us today because all Scripture has good application for our life. We just have to sometimes dig a little deeper and see what it might be. So in our series called The Wonder of Christmas, today we're going to be in Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 through 21. We're going to see three parts of this story that are absolutely wonderful. Luke 2, 8 through 21, three parts that are wonderful. If you're a note taker, first we see a wonderful interruption. I love Christmas holidays. I like the sweet treats. I like the get-togethers. I like the cooler temperatures. I like the colors. But for some people, I would even say for many people, the holidays are very busy and sometimes become overwhelming and even very stressful. You begin to think about all the things that you have to get done and not enough time to do it. I have to go to this party at 4 o'clock on Thursday. I have to get to get, get together on a Friday at 1 o'clock. I have to get to this place at that time. I have to prepare for this meal. I have to buy the food. I have to cook it. I have to clean up. We can't forget to invite crazy Uncle Bob. I have to avoid the COVID. I have to do this and that and this. And, ah! and we get so stressed out and overwhelmed that sometimes what we need is just a reminder of what the holidays are all about. Years ago, I found a list called a holiday bucket list. And I like to refer back to this to remind myself what the holidays are about. So we buy presents, most of us, and that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But even better is to be present in the moment with our family. We have to wrap those gifts, but maybe we can also wrap someone in a hug. We want to send the gifts, but we also want to send love to those who are lost and those who are lonely. We want to shop for food, right, for our parties, things we go to, but maybe we can also donate food to those who are hungry and have less. We're going to make cookies as a family. and Every year, we usually make tea cake cookies with homemade chocolate icing, praise the Lord. But when we're doing that, we're making memories that last forever. We want to see the lights and go and drive through Windcrest, but we also want to be the light. To me, what I consider this list to be is a wonderful surprise. It's an interruption that helps me say, okay, listen, I've been so focused on having to go to this place and that place and do this and do that that I've forgotten to even have joy to be excited or to even be present with my family or to enjoy this time as it is. A wonderful interruption is when there's something that maybe you're supposed to be doing that you don't really want to do, and something else comes along that's way better. It's when you're on your way to the gym, and somebody invites you to go eat donuts with them. And so you say, what a wonderful interruption, because the Lord would want me to build this relationship, so I need to skip the treadmill and go to the donut shop. It's when you have chores at home, and it's time to clean the bathrooms. You don't want to clean the bathrooms, and maybe one of your family members says, my favorite Christmas movie just came on. Will you please come watch it with me? (gasps) What a wonderful interruption. I can go and watch this movie and not have to clean the bathrooms right now. A wonderful interruption is when something happens in our life that causes us to pause and we can say, okay, listen, let's think about this a little differently than we have before because I'm afraid that too often when we have an interruption, we don't treat it as being so wonderful, but we treat it as being a disruption. I've been going through experiencing God. It's a long tested study that just helps you grow in your relationship with the Lord. And I do it with a couple of friends. And the premise of the book says that God is always at work around us. And God wants to have a love relationship with his children. And so he invites us to take part in what he's already doing. And then he speaks to us. And then we will have a crisis of belief where we have to decide, am I going to take faith and action and jump in? And that's going to require me to adjust my life in a major way. But when I do, then I'm going to experience God like never before. And I wonder how many times does God come into our life? And maybe it is an interruption that we didn't expect. But instead of us considering it to be a wonderful interruption, we consider it to be a terrible disruption. And we say, well, God, I'd be glad to take part in this, and I'd be glad to help you, and Lord, I want to be on board, but just not right now. It's Christmas week. 
I got a lot to do. I got to clean the house. I got to get everything ready. I still got presents to buy. Amazon's running late. I am stressed out. Come back in 2021, and then maybe you can interrupt my life, and I'll be on board. And so in the story of Mary, we saw a wonderful interruption that she wasn't planning to have a child at this time, and yet God knew the plan, and we see an interruption in Joseph's life that this wasn't what he expected of how his betrothal with Mary would go, and today we continue to see wonderful interruptions with the shepherds. At this point in the Christmas account, a decree has been given to where every male must return to the city of their fathers to be registered. So Joseph and Mary, they got on a donkey, not like the one in the video. They took an 80-mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and then Jesus was born in a stable, maybe a grotto, a cave. At that time, it says they wrapped him in cloths. They laid him in a manger, most likely some type of feed trough. And this is a great picture of the dissension that Jesus took from the glories of heaven down into the filthiness of earth to show us just how much he loves us. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field. They were keeping watch of their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. So in a field nearby, there are shepherds, and they're doing shepherd things. They're taking care of the sheep. They are making sure they don't have any stickers in their feet. They're making sure there's no type of animals that could hurt them in the evening. Maybe they're counting to make sure everybody is there and they're all accounted for. Maybe they're just resting on the side of the mountain and they're getting ready to go to bed. And then an angel appears. We don't know exactly what that looks like, but I can only imagine that it was pretty shocking. It was pretty overwhelming. It was not a very subtle thing for when the angel appeared, the shepherds go, oh, look, an angel appearance. This must be like the fourth one this week. Or I just saw a Netflix series on angel appearances. Now we get to tell them about we saw one too. This was a big deal. It says that the glory of God shone around them. So this is the light that surrounds God's presence. This is the moment on National Lampoon's Christmas vacation when he plugs in the 25,000 lights and it does a power surge all over the city. More light than we could ever imagine, almost blinding, I'm sure. In that moment, I would think that they think to themselves, okay, we got a couple of options here. There's an angel, there's this great light. We can A, run like we're chasing an ice cream truck. Let's get out of here before something bad happens to us. Or B, we can try to hide. If we jump in with the sheep, maybe it won't even see us. Or number three, we'll just be real still and maybe won't know we're even here. I've been fortunate to be uh, up close and personal with a few Santa Claus appearances this week. And whenever a Santa Claus goes to see young children, you see the same three reactions. Some kids run away in terror and in fear. Other kids, they hide. They'll jump behind anything they can to hope Santa can't see them. And the rest of them just stand there and don't move. Because it's like they think if they're really still, Santa can't see. So they had this fear. And so here is the angel's response <clears throat> to the fear of these men. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. The most important part that we see in this story here, where I think the Lord wants us to know today, is we would ask ourselves the question, why of all the people in the world would God appear to the shepherds? When I think of a shepherd... I would think this person is honest and trustworthy. They're like a farmer or a rancher in the world today. These folks are hardworking. They're dedicated. They are salt of the earth. But in this day and time, a shepherd was lowly, outcast, untrustworthy. So of all the people in all the world for the birth of Jesus to be revealed to the shepherds, we have to ask ourselves why. And the reason is for those moments in your life when you think to yourself, how could God ever really love me? I've done too many things that are wrong. I've fallen short too many times. I'm just not good enough. And then Jesus says, remember that I came first to the shepherds. To remind you, I didn't come to save the sinless. 
but I came to save the sinful and the lowest of lows. And if God can love the shepherds, I promise you that he loves you as well. His light shines around them. And in this moment, I think we see they had an experience with God that's no less incredible than the same experiences that we have. And maybe God shines a light around you. Or maybe it's just a moment of peace or of conviction, or maybe it's a miracle, or maybe it's a sign, but God is still speaking if we are listening. This angel comes and gives this message of encouragement. Don't be afraid. I have some good news for you. Good news to a shepherd. The weather's going to look nice for the next month. There's a low population of wolves this year. They're serving fajitas at the Shepherd's Union Banquet. All these things would be good news, but the good news here is that Jesus will be born. He'll be called the Christ, which means the Savior of the world. He's called the Savior, which means he is the promised Messiah of old, and he is Lord because he is God in flesh. And so here's how we take that news and we bring it into our life today in 2020. The same Jesus who was Lord, Savior, and Messiah born over 2,000 years ago is still the Savior, the Messiah, and the Lord of our lives today. And I wonder if what you need most in your life is for him to come and interrupt your day and interrupt where you're at spiritually or physically or emotionally or mentally because I wonder if it's been too long since you've been living your life as though he was the Lord of it or that you've been serving him as your king or you've been thanking him for being your Savior. The good news that came to the angels is still good news. E. Stanley Jones says that if it's not worth sharing, it's not worth keeping. How long has it been since you've told somebody about the good things that God has done and is doing for you in your life? And I firmly believe that God still gives us signs. And it's not like of being silly of like, oh, that's a sign, But it's really when we need direction, James says, if those who you need wisdom, ask God for it, he'll give it to you. And those who need guidance, that means that maybe he gives you peace or conviction, or maybe he does give you a sign, or maybe he gives you a big swat on top of the head when you need to turn yourself around and get your attitude right. But I think that God still leads us, he guides us, and he directs us. It's a wonderful interruption. And number two, it is a wonderful inclusion. One day a few weeks ago, my wife was making, it's a very old recipe we have from a family friend, and it's called a cream cheese pound cake. If you've never had one before, I'm not sure you've really lived. It's delicious, but it takes a long time. There's very specific steps. And there's one point in the mixing where the batter is so thick, you can barely even turn it. So my wife's in the kitchen, and she has the mixer, and I happen to be walking through, and she goes, this mixer won't hardly even turn this batter. It's just not strong enough. And she includes me in this decision-making process as what we should do next. So I thought, okay, thick batter, mixer not strong enough. Thick batter needs stronger mixer. I can handle this situation. So I went out to the garage. I came back. And this is what I came up with. I call this DeWalt Aid. You get it because like Kitchen Aid, but it's a DeWalt drill. DeWalt Aid. So go to the next picture. Look at how beautiful and creamy that dough is mixing up. Worked fantastic. So if you ever have something you can't mix, take your little blender wheel, stick it in a drill. It will go to town all day long. But I was excited to be included in the decision. Nobody wants to be the third grader on the fence not picked for kickball. Nobody wants to be the only church member who didn't get a Christmas card. Nobody wants to be the only family member who didn't get invited to the holiday party. We want to be included as a people, and Jesus wanted the shepherds to know they would be included in the story of Jesus' birth. Luke 2, verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So one angel, that'll shock your socks off. 
a multitude of angels, an army, more than we can imagine. I see this as a, a revealing moment. So maybe it's uh, you've been to a gender reveal party, and you're sitting there, and there's a hundred people around. This family has been waiting to have a child for five years, and she's pregnant. They're about to release everybody. The balloons, they'll have either blue or pink, and so everybody's on pins and needles, and it's nice and quiet. They open up the box. The balloons go in the air, and there's that moment of silence. Then they see the blue balloons, and everyone goes, ah, it's a boy, yay, it's great. It's an eruption of applause. It's the moment when a pageant is being had and it's down to this person or this person and they say and the winner is and there's a silent moment and they say miss texas was, it was, it was, it was. it's that moment at the last quarter of the football game there's 10 seconds left on the clock the quarterback throws an 80 yard pass and our team runs in and wins the touchdown and they win the state championship it's a whoa, pause wait 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 tension and then boosh eruption Jesus is coming. He will be the Messiah, the Savior, and the Lord. And there's this moment of quiet. And then I can hear God go, cue the angels. Boom, glory! More than they could ever imagine. Lit up the sky, hearing something they've never heard before. Preacher, I've heard this story, and I've been read to me before, I've even listened to it from my grandpappy with some hot cocoa. What's it mean for me, though? God is the master of getting your attention. God doesn't struggle wanting to know how to get you to hear from him. And when God shows up, it's still up to you whether or not you're going to participate. Because you have to choose, are you going to know that God is at work all around you? Are you going to be looking for him to speak to you? Are you going to accept his invitation? And are you going to make changes in your life that show you want to be a part of what he is doing? Because when you do, you're going to experience peace. If that was probably the greatest Christmas list ever, I'm sure peace would be at the top of the list for most people. And there's some of you here in this room, and there's many of you watching from home, who haven't experienced or felt peace for a long, long time. And I want you to hear me very clearly. You'll never find everlasting peace in your family or in your friends. It cannot be found in work. It cannot be found in addiction. It can't be found in the mountains or in the beach, in a virus or in a vaccine or in a political leader, a skill, a cream cheese pound cake, or even in Santa Claus himself. Everlasting peace means that we have an unchanging attribute in our character, regardless of our circumstance. That kind of peace only comes from one person, and that's from Jesus. A wonderful interruption, a wonderful inclusion that brings a wonderful peace. And number three, we see a wonderful invitation. Verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. How long did this scene last from this angel to this multitude of angels Was it a moment? Was it a second? Was it a minute? Was it an hour? We don't know, but it motivated them in such a way to where they said, God is doing something great, and we want to be a part of it, so we're going to go in haste. And so they run. They make tracks. Nothing's going to stop them until they see Jesus. What's so amazing is in their hurriedness, in their running, in their pursuit, it doesn't say they struggle to find him. It doesn't say they had to stop and ask directions. It doesn't say they have a GPS or a neon sign. They didn't have a trail of manna to follow. But because they were being led by the Holy Spirit, they went to where Jesus was and they found him there. To me, this is an encouragement for us that we have to stop hesitating in our lives. Because you know just as well as I do, there are times that God calls you to follow him, to serve him. And he says, stop and make the phone call. Go make the visit. 
buy those groceries and take them to that person, help them, reach out to them, love them, forgive them, and we have this hesitation. We go, but God, I don't want to. I don't want to right now, maybe tomorrow. I'm busy. I got a lot going on. This is an interruption that I just can't take right now. And when we hesitate, we miss the joy and the blessing of immediate obedience. Sometimes in life, we wish we could have a redo, a do-over. I wish I could go back to that time that God was calling me to do this, and I said no for too long. I wish I could do it again and not hesitate. I wish I would have had the faith to step out, because when you do, I promise you'll experience a peace like you've never felt before. We run all over the place. We run to family. We run to work. We run to our addictions, we run to the television, we run to our hobbies, and you will never find the peace that you're looking for until you run to Jesus. Verse 17, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been said, told to them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them, but Mary, she treasured up all these things, pondering them in their heart. They saw the proof. The evidence was there. There will be a child, the Son of God, born in this place, lying in a manger, wrapped in cloths. And they saw it with their eyes, and it says they believed. They embraced the evidence, and then that led them to action. They began to tell people the good news. And maybe that's where you're at in your life, as you feel like one of those shepherds, and you need to start running towards Jesus. And you need to experience the truth of the good news and then you need to take action and tell the people about who he is. Or maybe like Mary, this holiday season is time for you just to experience and feel and know and taste that the Lord is good. Because an experience, an encounter with God always requires a reaction. Verse 20. And when the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. And at the end of the eight days when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. They go back to the fields, and they're praising, they're glorifying God, they're skipping, and they're singing, and they're shouting because they're so excited because they heard the good news, they found out it was true, they told other people, and then they worshiped. If you're looking for a four-step process of how to find joy and peace in your life, here it is, folks, you hear the good news you find out that it's true, you tell other people, and then you worship God for it, and then you do it over and over and over again. How long has it been since you just thank God for the good news that he sent his son to die for you? How long has it been since you felt him shine down upon you like he did on those angels, through his angels to those shepherds? How long has it been since you've run after him? How long has it been since you told somebody about the good news of Christ? How long has it been since you just praised him for the way that he's loved you, provided, and forgiven for you? For several years, my daughter has wanted a rabbit as a pet. And she had rabbits when she was little, and they stayed outside, and that's a great place for a rabbit to be. But she's wanted an indoor pet rabbit to love and to hold and to squeeze and to hug it. And we've done really well at telling her what a bad idea that is for years and years. A couple of weeks ago, it was a Friday night, she sat my wife and myself down, and she says, I need to talk to you all about something that is very serious. From a 16-year-old girl, you never know what exactly that's going to mean. She goes, I need to talk to you all about exactly why it is so important that I get a rabbit. And she had created a Google slide presentation. So she plugged it into her TV, she sat us down, and she went through about 495 slides of all the reasons why it was positive and good that she needed a rabbit in her life. And then the very last slide was the cons. And it says, here's the reasons why I shouldn't get a rabbit, and this is what it said. None. There are no bad signs. 
everything is positive here. I have listed out all the good things, 427 reasons why I should get a rabbit. The cons are right here. There's none. There is nothing bad that can happen. There is nothing that can go wrong. There is no reason why I shouldn't get a rabbit. It was very convincing. And so the next day we took her, and she bought her new pet rabbit. And so here's a picture. I'm sure he'll be in sermons to come. This is Oliver, the black emotional support bunny. So he's super cuddly and very lovable, but even within this last week or so, as an outsider and as a dad, I promise you, there are cons to having a bunny rabbit. And there are responsibilities and there are things that you have to do that you might not want to do. So there may be a really long list of pros, but there is also a list of cons of having a rabbit that lives in your home. But when we look at the wonder of Christmas... And when we look at running to Jesus, and when we look at finding all of our peace in him, there is a huge list of pros. But there really is no cons. There is no cons to giving your life and putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Instead, it is wonderful. Doesn't mean it's always easy, but it means we always have peace. Doesn't mean that it's always fun, but we always have purpose. It doesn't mean that it's always convenient, but it means that he's always with us, so it's going to be okay. The wonder of Christmas says that there is a wonderful interruption that God speaks to us, but we have to choose if we're going to listen or ignore. There's a wonderful inclusion that says God involves us in this plan, but we have to accept or deny, and there's a wonderful invitation to know and see that Jesus is the light of the world. Truly, the wonder of Christmas is Jesus. Lord, today, I pray that we would know this absolute truth that in our lives, there are so many pros, so many positives, so many good things about following you. God, but there is no cons. There is nothing we should say this is a negative because following and serving you is our privilege and our joy. Lord, Christmas, if you were to ask someone what it's all about, the world might say presents, trees, ornaments, lights, food, time off of work, staying up late, sleeping in, Santa Claus, cookies and milk. But God, the true wonder of Christmas is the birth of your son. So today, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful interruption. God, that Mary wasn't prepared and Joseph wasn't prepared and the shepherds weren't prepared, but you were. And you were preparing a way for us to be saved. God, we praise you for this wonderful inclusion that when you revealed the birth of Jesus to the shepherds, you gave us a picture that it was for everyone, not just for the rich, not just for the poor, not just for the happy or just for the sad, not just for the tall or just for the short, but for everyone. That's how much you love us. Lord, a wonderful invitation to come and to see. Lord, who here today, who watching from home, just needs to come and see and taste that you are good, Know that you are forgiving. Experience your peace for the first time. Lord, help us not to be misled that the wonder of Christmas is not the lights or the fruitcake or the movies. All those things are good. But the wonder of Christmas is that our Savior was born, that it was foretold, it was fulfilled and completed, that we might be saved and have a relationship with you. How wonderful this is. Lord, thank you for loving us enough to lay in that trough. Thank you for loving us enough to sacrifice your one and only son. Thank you for loving us enough to include us and invite us in what you're still doing today. God, we pray this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together with us today. We're going to sing this song of invitation. And the Lord invites you to respond. If he's spoken to you through his word and through his spirit and through his song, 
maybe you respond through your own song, through your own prayer. If you want to pray, this altar is always open. I'm here if you'd like to pray with someone today. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. So glad that you are here today, whether on campus or online. Please join us on Christmas Eve. We will have our candlelight service. One will be at 4.30. One will be at 6 p.m. They'll both be live streamed and they'll both be here. And so you're welcome either of those places as we continue to celebrate the birth of Jesus. I hope you have the most wonderful Christmas you've ever had before. And we'll see you again very soon. thought they knew who you would be a soldier fearless and strong a warrior but they were wrong in the darkest night came the brightest light behold behold a baby